not as prestigious as the Stanley Cup, at least in my opinion. But anyway, he, he fetched it out of his garden after it had been stolen from an exhibition in London uh, and England this year. This was the year when England won its only soccer championship. Sorry, Andrew. They won over in West Germany 4-2 with uh, Jeff Hurst. I love the way he spells his name. Right, Jeff? Yeah. Mannequin. Uh, scored three goals. Three goals. That would be a hat trick in ice hockey. I don't know what it is in soccer. I don't think it's anything. It's a hat trick. Really? Well, they must have copied it from the hockey world. Anyway, so in the final game, which which two of which he got in extra time, which was pretty bizarre, and they were they were also very bizarre goals and very controversial. Next slide. So John also had a parakeet, which he named Tweety. Of course, Tweety isn't a parakeet. Uh, but in looking at Tweety, I was trying to get sound bites on Tweety. You know, I taught him a uh, pudding pad kind of thing. But uh, these weird things showed up with uh, Tweety in a major attitude, which, you know, oddly enough, matches John's attitude pretty close. Uh, next slide. So John grew up and went to, uh, I can't remember what FJ stands for, Turner High School, the Trojans, played defensive tackle, and he sang in the choir, reportedly. But I'm, I'm thinking maybe it had to do with the fact there were girls in the choir. So, but anyway, and then uh, I was thinking hard about this, and this is late at night, so you understand. Um, John had given me an eight track karaoke machine to get rid of. He said he salvaged it out of somebody's basement. But I'm thinking maybe John was a clandestine karaoke guy and maybe really did have a uh, like to sing. And I have a sound bite here of Homer singing something, but unfortunately it doesn't work. So we'll have to, uh, you have to come by my office and I'll play it for you sometime. Uh, next slide. So the second consequence of growing up on the farm and having a mother who was a dietitian is he didn't have any beef when he was growing up, and Beloit didn't have, you know, didn't have a, a fast food McDonald's on every corner back then. Uh, so we had to wait till he left home to to get a real burger. And of course, the soundbite here is, "Where's the beef?" And there's also a, a soundbite of Homer saying, "Mmm, burgers." Next slide. It really isn't as good as it is. Huh? <laughs> All right, so this I stole from the slide deck I did for Dirk Dennis Kaiser about the Badgers. Next slide. Uh, John got his three degrees, which I don't think is an academic hat trick, but anyway, at Madison, 79, 81, 85, studied under Lyle Horn. He came away with a healthy skepticism of satellites, which some graduates didn't always come away with. Uh, he did sample the amplifier and wares along Madison's infamous State Street. Now, I looked on the map and I got this picture of the State Street there at the bottom. Probably can't see it in the back. But I blew up this area around the State Capitol. This is where all the decisions are made. And there's, a, there's a, an establishment whose name is Graft. Only in Wisconsin. Probably does a really good business. Next slide. So this is, this is ostensibly from John's day, days as a grad student, uh, maybe a solstice party or Technic thinks it might have been Plummer's uh, costume party, and here you're clearly channeling Marlon, James, Vinnie, and the Fonz. I actually think it looks kind of cool, because I'm from that era, so. uh, except that a true greaser would not have facial hair. And I did follow up with John and found out that since his graduate days at Wisconsin, he's never shaved his mustache. And, and thanks for that. <laughs> Next slide. So this is Homer saying boring. Anyway, this is, uh, John goes on after he graduates to be a postdoc and research meteorologist at GFPL. And I know he talked several times about how Kiku Minkota would come by repeatedly, not just once a day, but repeatedly, every day, and ask how things were going, which made it easy for Eugenia to uh, entice him to come and get CA89. 
uh, where the rest is history. Uh, next slide. But before he left New Jersey, uh, he caught the collecting bug, which I can relate to. Um, and he was at a used bookstore somewhere in Cranberry, New Jersey. It's probably closed now. I uh, saw a book that he knew his dad had, uh, and he picked it up and started collecting vintage kids' books. He's got about 1,500 of them. Next slide. This is a little bit of trivia, factoids about big little books. I keep thinking how Lewis Black would, would do this bit about big little. It's a bigger and little! What's that? <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure his dad probably bought this book that he had at Woolworths in uh, for 10 cents. Next slide. So this is this is Homer saying, why doesn't anybody give me an award? So you have to come by and listen to it. It's a good one. So anyway, John in 93 won the Clarence Leroy Meisinger Award uh, for original contributions. Blah blah blah, um, and which this was no small feat. For the first time in 20 years, actually, it's really since 1960 when the tops first stops went up, they were able to sh demonstrate positive impact in the forecast due to the use of tops data. Um, not not something that was able to be done in the northern hemisphere up until that point. And since then, he's won a lot of medals and two administrator awards, but not the Atlas Airs too. That's probably a hinge joke which John is squeezing at at the moment. Sorry, next slide. Shorten the pain. So anyway, this is the, the Durber dogma is born. I don't know how to coin that phrase. But anyway, it has to do with the success due to the direct use of satellite radiances as opposed to uh, radius on lookalikes, which we all blame on poor Fred Schumann, who in the 60s told Nesdis, make them look like radius on so we can use them. And then, of course, there's Fred, who I think was a contemporary of yours, John, maybe a little bit ahead of your before you. Fred, I mean, uh, John Lewis. I had it. Okay. So we wondered if you would have for something. Anyway, next slide. That has nothing to do with the but I find a way to use the picture. <laughs> so offline matters. John meets Colleen at a volleyball clinic in Montgomery County, Maryland in 92. Supposedly there's a whirlwind courtship. I'm not sure about that. I had to make that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were married in Buffalo, Marlboro in 1994. Uh, and John, at some time around this time, he joins the lunch bunch at EMC. Um, and, and most of us, had kids, John Ward, Lori, uh, Wallow Pan, we would talk about, commiserate amongst ourselves about what the kids were doing. And, and Dave Plummer and John would talk about their dogs. Ah, next slide. I told you it went downhill after that first slide. All right, so what does EMC do after John's success? They send him off to our number one better European center. Um, which I suspect in the current environment would not have likely happened, uh, at least without some remuneration or, or what does he call it? Anyway. So anyway, John, um, uh, Colleen, that not having been married for too terribly long, gets to spend an extended honeymoon in lovely and enchanting and pretty England. Anyone been there? Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so turn around is fair play. John accompanies Colleen to Colorado on a, <clears throat> on a detail she has. She's back with the Park Service. Uh, and, and this is the neatest part. John nearly freezes to death on a remote mountain road, mountain top, where the signal is strong enough for him to, to scream the Super Bowl. Good thing the Packers won. <laughs> But I, I'm sorry, I'm a Caps fan. It's not. It's nothing compared to the Caps. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Speaking of near-death experiences, John and I have been talking about this for years, and it, it's still clear in our memories. I know. Um, so early in the nights, we had a workshop in Norman, Oklahoma, and there was a freak, uh, you know, early spring snowstorm, a foot of snow. I think John uh, uh, Jim Purser was stuck 
in, in Texas, and he rented a car, and he still couldn't make it up I-35. But we made it in. We called the cab that morning to go to the labs. We didn't know the government had closed for that day. And our taxi driver immediately informs us that he's a World War II vet, not a bad thing, but he's got a metal plate in his head, and he receives signals via that. <laughs> in other messages, so he speeds off and keeps up this nonstop rant. And, it, and it's like, I think it has something to do with the fact that the government lost his Purple Heart. And he leans back and goes, you guys aren't with the government, are you? <laughs> of course, we denied it. We got, off and we got out of the building, we got out at Dennis' house, even though uh, the building was closed. There is a video, a clip from the movie Ghost Dad, where there's a wacko taxi driver, and, and it comes close to our experience. But he's shaking his head. Bring it up. Sorry to bring back bad memories. Next slide. Yeah, we thought we were dead. All right, this is one of the videos I unfortunately won't get to see. Uh, but over, John had developed a reputation for anger management issues. This, this picture in the upper right is actually uh, George Vandenberg's office, so sorry about that, George. Uh, but this guy, this guy, if you see the video, he, he he's, takes out some aggression on that machine. Uh, John denies it. Next slide. Uh, Steve, I think, did send them to anger management training, but all we had to do was... You hang it. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. A lot of good he did. I just got to get with the cat's side of your mentality here. Next slide. That's Shelly, Melchior's cat, by the way. So other things that John and I would do for fun and relaxation, we would take these yearly trips to Ithaca, where they have a large book sale. Uh, he would buy books, we'd look for kids' books, and I'd look for records and computer games. And we'd always hit the casinos on the way up. And uh, while we were never uh, skunked in the collecting side of the house, we don't, didn't always come away with money in the side trips. Next slide. So also along the way, John developed a reputation for being a human wet blanket, which, which there's some description as to what that means on here. Uh, but in a scientific way, so to speak. Next slide. Uh, if you ever had a scientific proposal reviewed by John, you sort of have to get the gist of it. So that, that healthy skepticism that John got when he was at Madison um, would carry through. Next slide. So this is John's view of the research quality in this country. And, I, and uh, I made up this quote, because this really isn't a dodo bird, it's an albatross chip. But anyway, and don't, don't ask him about supplementals. So, so that led, John's attitude, of course, evolved. Uh, there's other words I can think of for that uh, process. Next slide. He composed this, this document, which describes the true crossing of the Valley of Death. There was a time, I have this associated with the General, General Kelly up there, uh, but I think the idea of research and operations and trying to get the two together and crossing this Valley of Death, you know, doesn't just belong to Jack. There's, there's other management people that have that. So the idea in perfect, the management idea, the vision, the fantasy, was we're going to meet on the bridge in the middle, and we're going to exchange, we're going to sing Kumbaya, and all this other stuff. But when in reality, as John has laid out here in, in copious parallelism here, the operations on the up, on the left side does all the work, and the research on the right side gets all the money and all the praise, and we're not there. Next slide. Send me that slide. Oh. <laughs> Can I take John's name off? <laughs> okay, so John isn't always mean and nasty. Of course, it, that's just his reputation. His, his team knows he's a really nice guy. So anyway, he's, he's also a baker, one of his hobbies, and, and so Colleen is also a baker, but she doesn't do pies. She does all the other stuff. John does pies, and it's great. We, we, the lunch table benefited from that for years. Uh, so one Thanksgiving, Mindy and I, our, our kitchen was in a total disarray because we were having it remodeled. And out of the blue, 
On Thanksgiving Day, John shows up with one of his home baked pies. I mean, I mean we were we were really touched. Um, Are you sure you didn't bring that? <laughs> no, no, you did this. You, you give a second. Anyway, so he drove all the way from Calvert County out to Crofton. Next slide. It was Northern Brock Calvary, yeah. Uh, but I, did I forget to mention that John, Colleen has five sisters? They were there, they were all there that day. So, maybe John was just trying to get out of the way. Anyway, the pies were good, and we like Colleen. Next slide. So over time, John found himself, like some of us did, the longer we stuck around, you advance or regress into management positions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wish I could have had this picture taken when I was retiring. I mean, we do see the, the, the killers there that, that are on the bottom, the, the project management, financial management, and personnel management. Oh, CBA. CBA is collective bargaining agreement. Next slide. So over time, John finally succumbs to the EMC syndrome. Yeah. Anyone who moves to Colorado, thank you, Mike, Mike Eck, Mike Ferro. Who am I missing? Anyway, so there's, I've heard rumors that the Super Joint Center may be out there, uh, but John denies having any interest working there. So I'm not sure. Next slide. What all he's going to do? Because Colleen's going to have a day job, and John's just going to be a house husband. But there's this site that you might want to look into. Next slide. Don't. <laughs> well, it's probably not a candidate for the Geek Squad, although he has the glasses for it. Uh, next slide. So I actually found on that mountain, <laughs> mountain jobs place. So this job is open. Uh, in case you would be interested, I think you're highly qualified. <laughs> Mountain poop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. So this is this is Homer saying it's time for my it's time for me to exit. So in all seriousness, we wish you uh, all the best. Joy ride, hiking, whatever. And you and Colleen enjoy. Next slide. So we're looking for things that we could do to help you out. So Outdoor World, not affiliated with uh, Bass Pro Shops. This is a locally owned establishment in Estes Park. And I was looking at the reviews and the last, there at the last sentence, they were, uh, this is what triggered it for me. So we went ahead and bought a gift certificate for you here at Outdoor World. Now in, in speaking with the proprietor, uh, unfortunately, they don't have any solution for, for dogs and snowshoeing. Uh, and, and as Colleen has verified, the park no longer allows dogs on trails in the park, which I think is really pretty bad. I think cats, you can get away with cats to do that. They're just food for the wolves. Anyway. All right, so, so when you get out there, stop in and you can get a your gift certificate. Uh, the next slide. Being bakers, out, we, we know you both bake, and uh, so Andrew, um, seamless, there you go. <laughs> don't even have to open that one. And I think, I, I think that may be the penultimate. Next one. Oh yeah, this is, um, this is John working on ways to improve his volleyball play at the net. <laughs> Spiking and blocking and all that stuff. You can play volleyball, you kind of get it. Maybe Daryl has more to say about this slide later. But other than that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. I, I think we all learned a lot, though, didn't we? So, so now we're going to, I mean, I'm sure some of you have stories to tell, so uh, we're going to invite people to come and, and maybe maybe share some, some thoughts about John. Maybe Dr. Uccellini would like to start. Do you have anything to say?
So, so I think this is the first time I'm talking at, at an event and John's actually smiling, so. <laughs> there he goes, all right. Okay, now I can go on. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really know what to say either, except I've been sitting next to technical all the, the whole time. And it's certainly been sort of a gold mine in terms of learning some things. Um, so, uh, first of all, the Wisconsin connection I knew about, and I'm a three for a two. Um, but uh, exactly 10 years uh, ahead of you, so we did not overlap. Uh, but I've certainly heard a lot about him, you know, even before today through Mike, uh, since Mike was one of his uh, TAs. And, um, and one of the things that uh, Mike was able to very readily point to the folks in his class that really excelled in their careers, uh, he got to Tom Actor and SSEC and John Zapatakne in the Air Force uh, weather. And he says, oh yeah, Derber. Um, so, uh, yeah, Derber as a student, he said he was very quiet in the back, was hard to get uh, much out of him in terms of uh, the interaction. Then he came back from one of his trips uh, from Goddard, one thing, I brought Mike out to Goddard, and came back and he says, you know, Derber was just yapping away, he says, wondering what the hell happened. So, um, but the connection with Lyle Horn, in all seriousness, I at least my experience with Lyle was that he was the heart and soul of the Department of Meteorology. They had a lot of superstars there at the time. But the one thing Lyle, I never had him for a class, but became very good friends with him. Um, but he was always encouraging people to uh, ask questions all the time. So I'm wondering, John, if, if you were born with that attribute or that came from Lyle as, 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 uh, as, as nice as he was, he would always tell you, don't, you know, don't believe everything the professor says. Just keep on asking him questions, you know, figure it out. So I, I wrote that down. Um, with respect to my first interactions with uh, John when I became the director of NSEP, I, I think he was avoiding me uh, because he would only show up my office when Steve brought him down. And then I realized that, you know, if Steve, you know, if, if Steve was feeling a little bit uncertain about dealing with me, um, whatever issue was coming up, and he really wanted to bring it home, he'd bring uh, John in, and John would just be, uh, you know, sitting very quietly, as far away from me as possible, you know, back in the corner of the office. Um, and then he would just growl something like, just remember, there's no silver bullets. From that, that quote on the, you know, because we were trying to deal with whether uh, a particular observing system was really going to make a difference or not, or a change in the, in the way we're approaching the uh, data assimilation. And I, I've never forgotten that. I've actually used that. I don't know if you remember that, but I've actually used that phrase a couple of times with uh, uh, every time we get a new management team in and they're showing me something that's going to uh, solve world hunger. I use that quote, right? And um, keep that in mind, Bill, in your, your, your exercise. You used it. Yeah. <laughs> so I do listen, John. I do, I do listen. Um, the other thing I remember, um, I was working with Svigal Chen 